Rough Tiger production. And you, and you, and you, and you were there. Some of it wasn't very nice, but most of it was beautiful. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to White Men Speaking Soft. Uh, this is Three minutes from the hearts of space. <laughs> from the well in Sausalito. Um, I'm Morris, that's Brian, and this is indeed Dream Idiots. Brian, how are you? I'm doing great. You? I'm doing well. It's beautiful here in Colorado. It's uh, habitable. There's no snow on the horizon, but it is almost June, so thank God for that. Um, Brian, what are we and what do we do here? Because I've forgotten. We tell stories, some history, some current events, some cultural stuff, some quizzes, just random things. Um, each week, we come with two stories. We don't tell the other person what's coming, uh, but every single week, Mo and I have something that we've brought to the table to share with the other to hopefully make each other laugh and we drag you along for the ride uh, we were back last week for the first time in about six weeks felt good to be back in the saddle after a, a slight hiatus and hopefully we'll be good to go for the rest of the year but you can uh, check us out on dreamidiots.com shoot us five stars on whichever platform you're listening to us on that would be great uh, facebook and instagram we're at dream idiots and uh drop us a line just an email at dream idiots podcast at gmail.com please do and we do take turns going first every week we don't have any updates i don't think this week um do I unless no you updates. do I, I will have updates I, I think for next week on a couple right. of old stories but i've got nothing this week all right so get us started this is episode 115 brian what do you got for us this week all righty so suppose for a moment that you wanted to kill somebody. Uh, I don't listen to too many podcasts and really only regularly listen to one um, true crime podcast. But those, uh, you know, when you hear those true crime stories, it seems like those stories, that, at least that I hear, are sort of dominated by uh, kind of three themes. Um, criminals are completely idiotic. They do awful things. And then they brag about it and somehow they have friends that help them. Um, number two, some of the, the, the stories in, in true crime podcasts and out there in general are just bloody and awful and disgusting, like horror movie awful. And number three, uh, an alarming number of people in law enforcement can't find their ass with both hands. So we're going to go back and start here with number two. Um, guns are messy. Knives are messy. Effective, mm -hmm. but messy. So we're going to talk about poison. Hmm. So harder to deliver. You have to scheme. Will they taste it? How long does it take? Can it be detected after they're dead? Yeah, could be effective and certainly way less messy. So the story I'm going to, I'm, going to, um, I'm bringing to you this week talks about um, poison. And when I found this story, I was like, this kind of rings a bell. It turns out there is a substance that is odorless, colorless, flavorless dissolves quickly in liquid and is a very effective poison. And I kept trying I kept thinking about it and think, is this, is this from a bond film? This sounds familiar somehow. And then I recalled the princess bride and then and there's a segment in there about Iocane powder. You, you, I'm sure you recall um, with Wesley and um, the character played by Wallace Shawn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, all, all that is, all, all that is obviously fictitious. Um, and this sounds like I'm the like Dream Idiots now has a, our first corporate sponsor. Um, thallium um, is the substance I'm talking about. I'm not endorsing mm -hmm. murder, but thallium is the substance we are talking about this week. So uh, thallium is a is an element. It was discovered originally in 1861, back in the day, way before modern medicine. This this stuff was used to treat. A host of conditions, gonorrhea, syphilis, gout. Um, and But then people realized, oh, wait, there's this really awful side effect that'll kill you. Um, and it causes muscle, it causes muscle damage, nerve damage. Um, by the 1960s, uh, it kind of evolved 
started being, being used a bit as a pesticide, but by late seventies, early eighties, it's essentially gone. Uh, so thallium is, is a metal, um, but doesn't appear naturally on its own. It's a byproduct of other things. Uh, it's made, for instance, from the production of sulfuric acid. Uh, and it can be a devastating poison at low doses. Uh, it can cause nerve damage, hair loss. Uh, and at high doses, it can cause a pretty quick and really awful death. Um, and it meets all the requirements, but it also hasn't been manufactured for uh, nearly 40 years. And it's sometimes referred to as the poisoner's poison. Uh, and I was right. It actually actually does um, feature, well, maybe not feature, but it is in the Bond film Spectre. Uh, and if you look it up, it's actually in a bunch of crime dramas and books and movies and you know, all those crime procedurals that are out there. There is a, um, an Agatha Christie book that came out in 1961 called The Pale Horse. Uh, in this story, there's a woman on her deathbed she, um, she's about to die. She wants to have one final confession with a priest who was called for. She dumps all kinds of secrets on, on to him. Um, before her secrets can be shared, he has been murdered, and Thallion is the weapon. So the Pale Horse is, uh, is in, in this book as a secret society that uses Thallium to dispose of people who are in the way. So that's our backdrop. The uh, Our hero this week... It's a guy named George Tripal. George James Tripal was born in 1949 in New York. His father was a cop. Not a lot is known uh, about his childhood. Uh, 1972, he decides he wants to become a gamecock of all things. He goes down to University of South Carolina and studies chemistry and psychology. Uh, 1975, just three years later, he is arrested, winds up spending two and a half years in federal prison for running a meth lab. So, you know, chemistry studies, you know, paid off for a little while. At some point after his relief release from federal prison, uh, not exactly known when, he marries a woman named Diana, and they move to a tiny town in central Florida called Alturas. Uh, Alturas is sort of midway down the shaft, if you will, of Florida. Okay. Um, she is, um, Diana is an orthopedic surgeon and, uh, he was not really employed in any traditional or meaningful sense, sort of a captain man, um, uh, turns out they're both members of Mensa and, uh, he apparently is really good with computers, but mostly just stayed at home. Uh, Mensa is, Mensa is the, is the high IQ society. Uh, I pretty much hate the idea of Mensa and I, I kind of hate any club that has that sort of weird exclusivity. Um, I've known two people that I can recall who were either in Mensa or claimed to be in Mensa and they were both ridiculous and, <laughs> and insufferable people. Uh, and so if, you know, if you're out there and, and you hear someone begin a sentence with the words, well, as a member of Mensa, dot, 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 uh, I think you have the right to do something unpleasant to them. Uh, so, she supports them financially, and he's kind of hanging out. As far as I know, they don't have any children. One of their interests, however, is uh, they are into hosting murder mystery weekends. Uh, if you ever hear that I hear me say that I'm going to go to a murder mystery weekend, you you have my permission to have me euthanized because no, thank you. Um, gotcha. But there's a the whole premise of this is there's a there's a fake homicide and there are clues. Uh, and everyone there for the weekend takes a role in the little drama. Sounds awful to me. Um, but, um, you know, this is something that they're into. And George, as a Mensa person, considers himself, I'm sure George considers himself to be an expert on virtually everything. But he does state um, often and openly that he is an expert on police procedure, forensics, crime scene processing, you know, all, all the important cop stuff. He, he knows this stuff. Backwards and forwards. 1988 rolls around. George and um, Diana are having problems with their neighbors. There's a newly married couple named Peggy and Pi Carr. Um, Peggy and Pi, but between them, have four children from previous marriages, uh, and they have one grandchild. So it's a busy house. Uh, you know, lots of noise, lots of um, commotion. Uh, in March of 88, 
um, because they are, you know, sardines in a can. He just, um, he decides to convert their garage into an apartment. Um, and George reports into the zoning board and, you know, kind of slows the process down and drives the costs up. And, um, George is making, you know, making a pain of himself. So over the course of, you know, five months, they have altercations eight or 10 times, um, music being blasted, just, you know, neighbor crap, basically, Mm -hmm. uh, in June, um, an anonymous letter is po- postmarked from nearby Barstow, Florida, comes to the car's house. Uh, there's an envelope. Inside the envelope is a typed, a typewritten post-it note, of all things. Uh, and it says, quote, you and all your so-called family have two weeks to move out of Florida forever, or else you will all die. This is no joke. Peggy Carr is... Um, pretty concerned she's you know she tells the kids to be a little wary but you know keep your eyes out be on the lookout for stuff it's kind of freaking her out uh pie is not really worried about it thinks it's just a prank kind of blows it off but they don't they, they don't outside the family they don't discuss this at all they don't tell anyone about it and uh october of this same year um diana um george's wife confronts peggy for blasting radios at high volume um and you know peggy and diana have basically a screaming match outside uh over over stereos being 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 you know, blasted and diana uh, when she's storming away yells you won't get away with, you won't get away with this uh and you know even though peggy is kind of sort of freaked out by the note she doesn't really connect this to diana freaking out on her um she kind of kind of mostly forgets about it but it's clear this is a a more than a slightly adversarial uh, relationship so peggy at this time is working she's waiting tables at uh, a restaurant she goes to work and this um this day this is you know october or so late late october she starts getting pain in her chest and legs and numbness in her hands. Um, at first, she, she's convinced she's having a heart attack. Uh, she goes home instead of going to the hospital and doesn't actually call an ambulance. Uh, immediately okay. after she immediately after she gets home, the pain gets worse, and Pi gets her in the car, and they drive to um, Bartow Memorial Hospital. So... Um, She's there. She is checked in. She tells the doctors that she feels like she's on fire. And the the doctors there don't really know what to make of it. Um, they keep her there for three days. Her conditions, you know, her symptoms get better. and But they basically dismiss it as being psychosomatic. You know, it's all in your head, lady. You're, you know, you're fine. Just go home. You know, you know whatever. So they kind of they blow it off. While she's there for three days, her, her condition does improve, but then she's released um, and goes home. While this is, while this is going on, um, two of her, of her essentially grown sons, Dwayne and Travis, also happen to be complaining about similar symptoms, stomach, stomach issues, burning sensations, tingling in their fingers. Um, a few days later, when Peggy is home, her symptoms get worse. They return, and she is transported this time to Winter Haven Hospital, a different hospital. And the, the physicians there uh, don't think that the symptoms are are psychosomatic. They think she's been poisoned. They're pretty convinced of it pretty quickly, and they figure out, or, or you know, they speculate at first that it is thallium. They test her urine, and her the thallium is through the roof in her urine. Uh, they then test Dwayne and Travis, find thallium in their blood as well. And uh, so now there is a crime. So police start talking to them, start talking to Pi. And Pi is told, yeah, your wife has, you know, 20,000, you know, you know, comically high levels of the, of the substance in her blood. And, <laughs> comically high. <laughs> uh, and Pi thinks that i mean no no one dislikes us enough to poison us that's this, that's crazy this is an accident this is something else this doesn't make any sense i mean this you know and see he kind of dismisses it uh so police are called uh and right, right around the same time peggy goes into the coma and you know in cases like this the first person that law enforcement 
I suspect is always the husband, always, always, always. And so they start um, grilling him, you know, somewhat more aggressively. They find out, you know, it's a it's a um, blended household, but it's unstable. They, you know, lots of you know, they, you know, they've been heard you know fighting with each other with each other in the past. Uh, and so the cops get convinced reasonably quickly that Pi did this, but then you know, and, and they and they check the blood um, or check the urine of everyone in the family. Pi has some thallium in his blood, but the daughter and the granddaughter do as well. And they basically say, well, yeah, obviously, mm. you know, he, he poisoned everyone in order to divert uh, suspicion <laughs> away from him to say, you know, basically, oh, I'm, I'm a victim as well um, or, or or an accidental poisoning. But I didn't, you know, this is not intentional. I, I mean, I did not try to kill my wife. Are the two sons, are they Peggy's sons or are they are they her sons or are they his sons? They are, I believe they are, they are her, they are her okay. sons. Yeah. Uh, so they then go to um, their house and start um, poking around there. And uh, after digging, you know, doing some digging there, they find um, Coca-Cola bottles, those 16 ounce plastic bottles that came out really in the eighties. And they find thallium in the bottom of four empty bottles that are in the trash and find it uh in three full bottles apparently unopened bottles of uh coke that are, that are sitting there as well uh and it's clear when they, look, when they look even you know more closely at it that the bottle caps on these things had been tampered with someone had taken the caps off and then managed to put them back on in a way that was it's, it's clear you know it's uh if you look closely at it it's clear it's been tampered with but to the you know to you just in passing opening it up you wouldn't necessarily notice it but it's clear that these these bottles have been uh messed with so now it's clear to them that okay this isn't pie this is you know this is something else someone else um they bring in the fbi to you know try to generate a profile of who would do a crime like this this sort of indiscriminate um killing a little bit of um of of you know of not strangers but obviously anyone can, can consume a coke so FBI says, yeah, the person the person who commits a crime like this is a white male who's has you know above average intelligence in his mid thirties, who is someone who is um, very reluctant to deal with do anything in you know, direct direct confrontation is something they avoid. Uh, this is someone who would happily make threats though, and someone who absolutely would take pleasure in watching someone suffer and die from a distance. Um, George at this time is 39 years old. So the police start interviewing people and go around and talk to anyone, everyone they can think of. And they talk to George Trapal as well. And he mentions in his interview that he thought somebody wanted the family to move out of the neighborhood and, um, that there was some, you know, there may have been some sort of threat. He's the only one that mentions this to the police and of course the family hadn't hadn't told anyone about the about about this letter somebody wants them to move out i don't know who <laughs> right. i'm not saying i want them gone so uh and so you know their focus is honing you know, more and more in uh, on george they search his trash at his house and at his office and they find nothing uh and the case you know kind of goes cold a little bit uh, this is, you know, when, when Peggy, Peggy originally is, is sickened, it's, you know, October, uh, or early November of 88, March 3rd, 1989, Peggy card dies. Uh, she's been in, in, you know, never, never regains co consciousness and she dies. So now we have a murder. So the next month, uh, an undercover officer, a woman named Susan Gorick, um, writes to George and and says that she wants to come to one of his Mensa murder weekends. And he writes back and agrees. And um, she goes and they get along great, they get along with, with his wife as well. And, they, and they're kind of, they're hanging out as, as friends a little bit. She goes to his house and Susan's, you know, going around George's um, living rooms, you know, kitchen, just poking around, you know, uh, and, um, just happens to glance over at some of his books and sees a, an Agatha Christie novel called the pale horse that's just sitting out on a table. Um, 
in a later later conversation, you know, Susan, of course, makes makes up a fictitious backstory about how she is uh, having a nasty time. You know, she's going through a nasty divorce and um, he, you know, George just volunteers that it's completely possible to poison people and she could could send her husband uh, poison poisoned flowers and that they'd be uh, you know, a very effective way of, of, <laughs> of killing her husband. So, oh, Lord. again, super interesting. Pretty compelling, very circumstantial. So again, the case kind of goes cold. There's nowhere really else to go with it until November of 89. And um, Susan thinks that their luck is changing. George tells her that he and his wife are are moving to Sebring, Florida, which is a little bit further south. It's closer to the foreskin of Florida. Uh, and they're going to rent out their house in Alturas. So Susan, <clears throat> thinking quickly, uh, asks if she could rent the house from them. George quickly agrees because he wants a good tenant and someone he knows. And so George and his, George and his wife move on uh, to, to Sebring. And pretty much the second George pulls out of the driveway, uh, the police are there to search the house, which they do. Uh, in their search, they find a journal uh, with with information about how to formulate or you know and isolate various poisons. Of course, George has extensive uh, chemistry knowledge. Uh, they find in his garage a commercial machine for capping bottles. Mm -hmm. You know it's the the mechanism for, for, for putting mm -hmm. those for putting those on. It's like if you had a side hustle in your garage where you're bottling something. He had purchased a bottling a bottle cap machine. Or, you know, if you're if you're a home brewer, you might have something like right. that. Something like that. Right. Beer. Right. Or, yeah, sure. Right. right. So uh of course they already have the Agatha Christie book. George is the only one who mentions uh that the cars are under pressure to leave and and he has access. This is a small town in the eighties in Florida. It's I mean, current population of Alturas is like four thousand. This is more than 30 years ago. I let's put me in population then, certainly less than 2,000. No one's locking their doors. He lives next door. Uh, they find beakers and flasks and a Bunsen burner. Uh, and remember, I said that that thallium was a byproduct of various chemical processes. One of those processes is the, is the manufacture of meth. So making meth makes thallium. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, and eventually, uh, lab technicians report that they find trace amounts of thallium on a small glass brown bottle in his garage. Uh, and George is arrested in April of 1990, and he's charged with 15 crimes, uh, one count of first degree murder, uh, numerous counts of attempted first degree murder, seven counts of poisoning, one count of tampering with consumer products, I mean, a whole host of things. Um, at his new house in Sebring, they find more books on poison. Uh, as at, at the new house, I, I, this is mentioned in in all the accounts of this story. It's mentioned that the new house also has bondage material, and that and the new house has a soundproof, windowless secret room. I don't. Okay. Oh uh, dear God! <laughs> <laughs> like so, he was planning something, presumably. Um, and George is found guilty on all counts. Um, on this is February of 1991, and uh, March 1991, he is sentenced to death for the murder. Oh, shit. So, uh, at this point in time, uh, good old George is, uh, he's still on death row. He, uh, is, you know, appealed and appealed and appealed. Uh, his last appeal was in 2012 to the u.s court of appeals for the 11th circuit he's been on death row for 30 years if you want to write to him he's uh at the union correctional institution in rayford florida um, rayford but, but a a genius man a, a mensa man but how stupid can you be quit talking and throw shit away not that i'm advocating for murder but i just god how dumb can you be well, it's the ego that tripped him up, right? I mean, it's just the, yeah, that's, yeah. Well, a couple of, you, you know, I always have observations about things like this. So, two observations. One, this isn't long after, this is what, seven years or so after the Tylenol scare. 
Yep. Right. So we're dealing with a, pra- a packaged, a prepackaged uh, item you can buy in stores. Mm-hmm. Did Coke? Did Coke do anything? Did Coke know about this? I'm guessing. Oh, that's a good question. That, I don't know. This, this I, is. I, I think the. the I think those, six, those sixteen ounce bottles came out. Came out in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, there were cans, and then, um, mm-hmm. and then, further back, there were they. They're always in, in glass bottles. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, it feels like this Probably. is right around the right around the time when, the, when yeah. those plastic bottles had just come out. I think. And uh, second observation, I'll bet that was some really shitty music they were blaring back and forth <laughs> at each other. I mean, just the worst kind of George Michael and eighties <laughs> crap. Yeah, in excess. <laughs> uh, and Rayford, of course, makes a second appearance. That's where uh, Flory Flory uh, Fisher did her. Uh, Time oh, yeah, for, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Story. yeah okay. I forgot about I, that. Yeah, I've never heard of this dude in this murder. This is uh, this is astonishing. Um, you know, just didn't follow the rules, you know, didn't uh, yeah, I'm smarter than you, you can't catch me. I'm like, okay, okay, planned everything out meticulously and then didn't, didn't, <laughs> and then fucked didn't, it up, <laughs> didn't, didn't take care of the backswing and get everything else. What a yep. turd. <laughs> Still on death row to this day. Yep, and and, and, name... so, and, and still has people that, that defend him. You know, of course, he didn't do this. His wife defended him. His wife passed away, I think, in 2018. Um, she, you know, she had a stroke and died, and but she defended him nonstop. Uh, he still has advocates out there that say, you know, he's a smart man. He would never have done this. Blah blah blah. But um, I don't know. I'm I'm pretty fervently against against the death penalty. So I don't know what I'm hard to hard to know what to say about this dude. Obviously a bad human being, but damn, he needs to be locked away and kept away from chemistry sets and uh, you know that kind of stuff. I think um, right. Yeah, what a horrible human being. <laughs> and we are not a true crime podcast, but we are not a true. Pri- that is right. <laughs> right. But I think it's a more. I think it's more a commentary on how when you tell people they're smarter than others, they feel like they can get away with shit and. Yeah, yeah, that that, that, just... that sort of piety just drives me crazy. Just, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah you're so smarter. Was... Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Thanks, Brian. That was awesome. I'd, I'd never heard of this dude. Uh, and it's no surprise that it happened in Florida, is it? I mean. No, I was. That, that's why I was trying. I, I was trying to make, make fun of Florida in, in there a little bit. With some yeah. My, I, yeah. My, I, my, my aside. Did you catch that? Yes, I did. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay, good. <laughs> I, I was trying to be subtle. Speaking of subtle, Brian, do we have a curse word of the week? It's time for the Dream Idiots curse word of the week. We do. Curse word. <laughs> Ever heard of a gravy seal? No, I have not heard of a gravy <laughs> seal, Brian. A gravy seal. Uh, so you know, we have those folks out there. Um, at some point here in the, in the last year, there are, there are a bunch of them that showed up at the Texas Capitol with you know guys that, that walk around in public with, with the AR-15s. Who are obsessed with the military, mm-hmm. but who, who, who the military would never ever accept yeah. um, because of their, you know, dangerous and you know out there tendencies. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're not Navy SEALs; they're Gravy SEALs because of their, um, you know, their, um, you know. <laughs> so they're, there you have it. Gravy they're SEALs. <laughs> their, their their hideous diet and their, and their backwoods beliefs. <laughs> the gravy seal. Gross. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. My story. Uh, I almost did this last week, and I'm glad I didn't. Um, I told you a little bit about it uh, after we got off air last week. Uh, here we go. January 13th. 1982 was a rough day for the transportation industry in Washington, D.C. I've never been to Washington, D.C., Brian. Have you? I've never been. I've been many, many times, Joe. Yeah. Never been. A blizzard had pounded the nation's capital since the early morning hours, dropping 6.5 inches of snow. A gridlocked mess of traffic clogged the streets and the 13 bridges crossing the Potomac and Anacostia Rivers. Washington National Airport, now known as Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport, had planes stacked and racked, delayed until conditions improved for takeoff, which would not happen until after 12 p.m. that day. The city's metro rail system would be okay. 
until about 4.30 p.m. when three cars would derail inside the tunnel at the Federal Triangle Station, resulting in three passenger deaths. These would be the first deaths in Metro Rail DC history. In between the morning gridlock traffic and the late afternoon Metro accident would come one of the worst air disasters of the decade. By rush hour, the city would be virtually paralyzed. Air Florida Flight 90, with five crew members and 74 passengers aboard, departed from Washington National a mere hour and 45 minutes late, bound for Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport with a stop in Tampa. The captain, Larry Wheaton, was 34 and had logged 8,300 flight hours, with over 2,300 of those in commercial jet time and over 1,700 hours with a 737, the Boeing plane under his command this day. Wheaton had been suspended for nearly four months in 1980 for failing a Boeing company line check in the areas of adherence to regulations, <laughs> checklist usage, departures, huh. cruise control, and here's the capper, approaches and landings. <laughs> he was reinstated after a proficiency check in, quote, memory items, knowledge of aircraft systems, and aircraft limitations. He passed a recheck a few days later. This was after he had received a, a grade of unsatisfactory in 1981 on another company proficiency uh, test. The first officer was 31-year-old Roger Pettit, a former United States Air Force fighter pilot, as well as an instructor pilot, a flight examiner, and ground instructor. He had over 3,300 flight hours and was the PF, which is the pilot flying for the first leg of the flight. The airplane reached an altitude of only 352 feet or so. And one of the survivors, Joe Stiley, described the takeoff as, quote, rough. And he immediately assumed the bracing or crash position as the plane lifted off. Uh, Stiley was in his spare time himself a pilot, so he recognized there was something going on. It was a rough takeoff? Uh-huh. The That's 737 weird, okay. was in the air for approximately half a minute before banking hard to starboard and crashing into a segment of the 14th Street Bridge complex known as the Rochambeau Bridge, some three quarters of a mile from the runway. This bridge section includes portions of I-395 northbound. Flight 90 smashed into six vehicles, killing four of their passengers instantly before plunging into the Potomac. The plane was submerged upside down, the tail section broken off. Most aboard were killed instantly, although it is estimated that some 19 passengers may have survived, but their injuries prevented them from escaping the plane. Five passengers. And I'm going to get this unfortunate name out of the way and let you get this out of your system because this first name is really unfortunate. <laughs> Nikki Felch. Hmm. No, no problem there. Bert Hamilton. <laughs> Joe, the aforementioned Joe uh, Stiley. Priscilla Terrado and Arland Williams Jr. and one crew member, Kelly Duncan, exited the tail section. But what awaited them outside was 24 degrees Fahrenheit weather with snow still falling. And then there was the Potomac River, churning water near freezing at 34 degree Fahrenheit with chunks of ice bobbing here and there, smashing against one another. Jet fuel was, quote, everywhere, the smell of it sharp in the winter air. When they went in the river, assuming exhaustion from trying to stay afloat, and according to the cold water survival time calculator, the survivors had between 15 to 30 minutes rescue time left of them. They were stuck 200 feet from both shores, right in the middle of the river. The banks had two feet of snow built up on them. The ice was untrustworthy for walking. Is this story sounding familiar? Mm, I remember this, him. Ambulances were delayed by the gridlock and the plane's collision with the bridge. The closest tugboat on the Potomac was downriver, already engaged in a search and rescue mission of its own. A Bell long-range helicopter, the Eagle One, was dispatched from Anacostia Park, but wouldn't arrive for 20 more minutes. Roger Olean, a local sheet metal worker, raced down to the riverbank from the bridge and was the first passerby to help. Workers from the Pentagon, who had also been stuck in traffic, tied a makeshift lifeline of rope and jumper cables around Olean's waist. He jumped into the freezing waters and twice tried to make the swim out to the survivors. He had to be reeled back in, covered in ice. 
The Eagle One helicopter arrived about 4.20 p.m. and the crew performed admirably, hovering over the river as close as they could, the skids sometimes dipping into the water. A lowered rope was the best and safest means of extraction. Lenny Skutnik worked in the Congressional Budget Office. He stood on the bank watching the rescue efforts. Priscilla Tirado, still in the water, was too weak to grab the rope. She was blinded by the jet fuel and had already lost her husband and infant in the crash. Ugh. Lenny couldn't watch her struggle any longer. He ditched his boots and coat and dove into the river, towing Priscilla Tirado back under his arm in a tremendous feat of swimming. The remaining survivors in the water took turns grabbing the rope and being lifted up out of the river and across to the bank. Arland Williams Jr. kept passing the rope along to the next person in the freezing water until he was the last man left waiting in the Potomac. When the helicopter returned for the final trip, Arland was gone, having succumbed to the cold. He had slipped beneath the chopping waves and ice. All told, 74 people on Air Flight 90 perished. Four more on the 14th Street Bridge and three more a scant 30 minutes later beneath the streets of D.C. when the Metro Rail cars derailed. 81 lives lost that cold and snowy day. The National Transportation and Safety Board found that multiple issues caused the crash. Some of the most evident were, number one, sterile cockpit procedures were not followed. And what do you think that means, sterile cockpit procedures? No idea. Okay. What it means is, is you basically, you don't chat about anything else other than the conditions of the plane. Okay. No, no, no. no how are you? How's your weekend? Yeah. Hey, Joe. You're right. It <laughs> is, that. it is, yes. <laughs> Two, and you, you mentioned this in your story last week, anti-ice anti heaters for engines were not used on the ground. For some reason, the anti-ice okay. heaters were not sure, used. Sure, makes sense. There was a decision made to take off with ice present on the airfoil surfaces. And of course, the air <laughs> airfoil is are the surfaces of the wings that help you lift. Get you lift, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Number four, the captain did not reject takeoff when presented with anomalous engine readings. He was getting weird readings on the on the on the dash, and he proceeded to take off anyway. Five. The limited experience of the pilot and the first officer in snowy conditions. The pilot had only eight takeoffs and the first officer only two in such conditions. I mean, it's an Air Florida flight. Right. Right. I mean, they didn't see this stuff. And another example of this is they followed a DC-8 closely on the runway, thinking the exhaust of the plane would keep the wings warm, which was totally against procedure. So all it did was melt the snow, which would curve around the wings and then refreeze on the backside. Right. I think that's what happened. Roger Olean and Lenny Skutnik were honored by the Coast Guard with the Gold Life-Saving Medal, as was Arland Williams Jr. posthumously. The Coast Guard also awarded Eagle One pilot Donald Usher and paramedic Melvin Windsor with the Silver Life-Saving Medal, and the Department of the Interior honored them with the Valor Award. Olean, Skutnik, Usher, and Windsor also received the Carnegie Hero Fund Award. Flight attendant Kelly Duncan, the only crew member to survive, was commended by the National Transportation Safety Board for her action in giving the only life jacket she could find to a passenger. And if you drive over that particular stretch of I-395 into D.C. these days, you no longer pass over the Rochambeau Bridge. It was rechristened in 1985. Commuters now pass over the Arland Williams Jr. Memorial Bridge, named in honor of the man who passed up a lifeline time and again for his fellow passengers. And that is the story hmm. of Air Florida Flight 90 and the day it crashed in the Potomac River. Wow. So sources for this were goodcalculators.com for survival time in the water, Susan Miller's uh, USA Today, January 13, 2019, Air Florida Flight article, crashed in the Potomac 37 years ago today. Tripsavvy.com for great information on all the bridges that go in and out of Washington, D.C. I, I believe it's second most to Pittsburgh for the number of bridges in mm -hmm. terms of a city. And Wikipedia for some basic information. Uh, this story, I remember when it happened because I was about 10 years old, and this story has stuck with me for uh, years. Um, Arlen Williams, his he's appeared in song for what he did. Uh, there was a movie that was partially based on this called Hero. 
Um, it's just a remarkable tale of of something that starts off horrible, gets worse, and then some people make some just astonishing decisions to help. Right, other sure. People. And it's right. uh, I, I'm kind of glad I didn't do it last week because that would have been a <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a weird yeah that would have been a horrible coincidence. <laughs> And I'm calling that story passing the rope uh, for uh, Arlen Williams Jr. Cool. Um, yeah, that was uh, that was one of those. I, I recall that vividly. I actually have some family that let me that still live in um, who work at the at the Pentagon and who live in a high rise apartment complex or condo tower, or whatever, on Joyce Avenue, which is right next to the Pentagon. And who's their, their view is basically northeast, and so I mean, it's been decades since I've been there. But um, you know, I'm, so I, I've been over all those bridges several times. I've driven, I've driven out to Virginia from DC before. Um, but when, when you go to their apartment, their view is basically watching planes land and take off. And so, I mean, so they they could. Very, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I never asked them about it, but they could very well have seen that if they'd been sitting because their their kitchen window was that was <laughs> their well half mile from the from the airport or they might have been stuck in traffic trying to get home because the city was just a damn yeah, mess gridlock, that day. Yeah, right, i mean it was right. just you could you could not get anywhere for hours and hours and hours um you know and i think about that when i when i was living in new york about you know just how close things are if one things go goes wrong mm-hmm. how you could just be eh, i guess i'm walking I guess i'm walking 80 blocks to get home now right um if the subway shuts down or um, another thing that made me think of it is, is we lived on Roosevelt Island when my wife was uh, pregnant with our first child and she would ride the tram across and she just missed the tram when it got stuck over the East river for like 12 hours. And she could have Jeez. been stuck up there just dangling over the East river. Ugh. Um, anyway, a horror show and one of the first aviation disasters that I really remember. Uh, yeah. Air Florida flight 90. And that's all I got this week. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, And thanks for listening, folks. We appreciate it. Um, We'll be back again real soon. Please go on whichever app you're on. Give us five stars. Shoot us a review. Uh, Check us out on Dream Idiots. We have merch on dreamidiots.com as well. Uh, Check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Dream Idiots. And shoot us a line if you ever ever get the burning desire to do so. Dream Idiots podcast at Gmail. And you can even find us on Patreon too. If you want, if you want to see our talking, our talking heads, telling these stupid stories, you can do that too. And but, we'll be back not, again. Not, not burning in a thallium way or a no. jet fuel way. <laughs> just, just right. a burning way. All right, cool. Be good to each other. Bye. This is a Rough Tiger production. Bong bong, mm-hmm. Brian. Bong bong. Bong bong. Bong bong. Good. <laughs>